Welcome to part two in this exclusive four-part series with David Adair. And here the story resumes where David actually gets to travel to Area 51 to see a large life-size model of the electromagnetic fusion containment engine that he developed for his test rocket called Pithalum that was 10 foot tall. So you see the documentation that he supplied showing that uh, such a rocket was built. Now, he describes what happened at Area 51 with a a German paperclip scientist, uh, Dr. Arthur Rudolph, who really is the bad guy in what transpired, and uh, how uh, David was rescued uh, by... uh, General Curtis LeMay. So let's hear his story. You are listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. So we are with David there for part two of this interview about his life experiences and we are going to resume from him meeting Dr. Arthur Rudolph at, uh, at White Sands Missile Range. Right. Well, the DC-9 pulled to a stop, tail dropped down, they came off the back and um, all these guys in black suits white shirts, skinny little black ties, and mirror sunglasses. Looked like a uniform in a way. And um, and then this one little guy got off at the end. He's small, uh, wearing khaki. Looked like he came off of a safari. <laughs> That's where he did. Uh, all he's missing was the shirt where you put the bullets in the sleeve. And um, that was Rudolph. And I said, who is that? And Colonel Williams, just dead pan with no smile, he said, that is massive trouble. We're in really serious, serious trouble. He said, I gotta go make a phone call. So he went and called LeMay. Told LeMay that Rudolph just showed up. I didn't know that, find that out later. But LeMay goes, get me my jet. LeMay had a Gulfstream 33 that's given to all the generals in the military at that time. So he's going to get on his jet and head out to White Sands. So he's packing up to come out there. Rudolph gets off the plane and he walks straight over to where I'm at. And um, he looks at me and he says, who are you? I said, who are you? He said, I'm just a guy that checks out new technology for the military. How about you? And I told him, I'm just a guy that flies rockets in cow fields. So there was kind of a bad stare there for a second. He walks on by me. Then we walk in and he said, you want to show me your rocket? And she's laying on a sideways on a stand. And I take a block of metal I have and I rub it over its side. And there's not a seam or rivet anywhere on it. And all of a sudden the door raises up and swings out. He goes, what is that? And I said, it's called a dissimilar metal lock. It's old fashioned. You ain't never seen one of these? He didn't even know about that. You ever, have you ever seen a dissimilar metal lock? They're around. They've been around since World War II. Come from the same place where the damn metal came from. You know, what is this stuff? I think it's something reversed from a down UFO. I really do. Because they had stuff that was just crazy technology. Light up a room with no visible lights. How do you do that? With no shadows. How do you do that? I don't even know. I can't even today figure out how you do that. Um, All kinds of stuff was coming out of shape. So, um, when you say coming out of shape, that's Supreme Supreme uh, Allied Powers Europe. That's where I got the dissimilar metal lock. I said it's old, it's World War II. 
But apparently it's something he's never seen. He's all pissed off about that now. He's pissed off about a lot of things. He sticks his head down in there and looks at my... He's looking for a combustion chamber. He's looking for a diffuser wall. Typical rocket components. It ain't there. It's just a figure eight humming cyclotron. And he's looking at that and he's getting down lower. And then I put my head right by his ear and I say to him, do you know that this device that you're looking at, now he's the designer of the F1 Saturn V engine that took us to the moon. He, he got some serious ump of his own. He wasn't at Pina Monday just to be a, a Gestapo killer, which he was, but he was also a rocket scientist, a good one. So he built the F1 Saturn V engines, which is the most powerful rocket engines of today, even today, more powerful than Elon Musk's rockets. I mean, five of those engines produce 7.5 million pounds of thrust. Three and a half billion 426 Hemi engines of wide open equivalent. Three million 426 Hemi engines. It's mind boggling. And yet he looked down at that thing and I said, did you know that that thing has 10,000 times the power of your F1 Saturn V engines, Dr. Rudolph? He raises up, he looks, he's red as a tomato and he looked at me and he said, who are you? And I said, I told you I'm just a guy that flies rockets in a cow field. I know his name. He knows I know who he is. I just reduced his work to a damn minuscule. So you remembered at that time what the warning Dr. Yeah, Von Braun had was given going you. through my head. He said, we're in serious trouble. And I never saw Do uh, Colonel Williams take off so fast to make a phone call. So I said, uh, he looked at me and he said, I'm taking over. Just that simple. He said, I own you. I own this rocket. I own everything. Williams works for me. He put Williams in lockdown. He, he locked him in his uh, room. And I went, oh shit, this is getting bad. So I said, I need to go call my dad. My dad expects a phone call from me. And my dad was expecting a phone call. We had had a conversation before I left when they dropped the Piggly Wiggly over the semi. I told my dad, I need to talk to you in the backyard. So we went and had a talk. And I said, if I should ever call back and tell you, just light your pipe and take it easy. I want you to burn every damn thing we've ever built to ash. I want you to burn all the drawings, all the math papers, Everything, anything that's scribbled on the pad, burn it, burn it all. Melt the, the prototype rockets, melt everything, just leave nothing. Dad said, are you sure that's you, man? That'd be like trying to kill you. I said, do it. If I tell you that, we're in serious trouble. Well, I called back and Dad answered the phone. I said, hey, Dad, how you doing? I'm doing okay. Time for you to light your pipe and take it easy. So my dad goes out to shop and he burns everything. There's nothing left. Not even the slightest scribble. Nothing. In about an hour, these black vehicles show up. About 10 of them in my dad's front yard. All they find is a drunk man in the backyard, drunk out of his gourd, sitting next to a smoldering pile of shit and there's nothing left. Now they got nothing. Now, I'm sitting there with a pistol and looking at her and I'm going, I'm going to have to blow your ass away. Then they'll only have me. And I'll take myself out. But, but tell us about the test. The test from White Sands to Area Yeah, 51. well, we're getting to that. So, my dad burns everything. So now I know paper trails being burned behind me. There's nothing left. Two can play this game. I knew they were good at burning shit. So I'm doing it. I'm giving it back to them. So now I said... Um, and you only did this because... Rudolph this said, Rudolph? I own you. R right, I see. When he said, I own you, I own your rocket, I own everything. And I thought, uh-huh, you're on, going to own a bunch of ash in a few minutes here. And they had no idea I had set this all in place. 
They think I'm just a naive 17 year old kid. Well, guess what? I'm 17 going on 53. So, um, it kind of bothered me that, you know, all that was gone. It's all, it's all gone. Years. Ever since I was, you know, six years old, it's all gone. You just torched it all. And I thought, well, I could rebuild it, I guess, but I don't think I want to. So, and it gets worse. The story gets a lot worse. So, we go to roll this thing out on the pad. And then Rudolph tells me, change the navigation coordinates. I said, I, I'm so precise at it now, I can bring this damn thing back down and it can drop a parachute on the damn pad. We don't have to walk anymore. He wants me to drop it 436 miles northwest of us. And I said, what in the hell is 436 miles northwest? Well, I pull out geophysical maps. And guess what? There's nothing on the maps except from one big dry lake bed called Groom Lake. And I'm going, we're going to land in the middle of a dry lake bed? And I turned around to Rudolph and I said, you see your DC-9 out there? It's got tires. How the hell is that thing going to land on a dry lake bed? You're going to moor up to your belly. You know, and he's told me, just shut up and launch a rocket. So I set the coordinates. It's all off the shelf stuff. It's nothing fancy so it's all set and I said it's all set it's ready to go so we go back to the bunker at the end of the row because out from there there's nothing there's three miles of pure desert and then the pad and um, <laughs> Colonel Williams decided to use his brain about now bad time to use it though because he's standing there and we're on countdown and he turns around to me and he says to me, you know, Colonel Williams is pretty smart. He, uh, he has a degree. I think he's a PhD, um, nuclear physicist. So he knows his stuff. So he turns around to me and says, David, when have you had, when did you do the test on the fields to see if they're stable? And I went, test? Who the hell's had time? It's been one thing after another. We've been rushing, rushing, rushing. And I said, this is the test. <laughs> William's eyes get about this big. Head. Oh, God. And so he hits the red cancel thing. It's too late. Rockets on the internal onboard computer. It's, it's now self-sufficient. It's on its own. And he is just, he's just going nuts. And finally I said, Colonel Williams, come down. I said, let's do this. See that big flat wall right there? Yeah. Well, let's do a jumping jack. If the fields don't hold, we're going to put the neatest shadows you've ever seen on the wall. And he goes, oh, God, you know what? <laughs> because we will not be 93 million miles away from the sun. We'll only be three miles. If the fields don't hold, you're going to have a sun sitting there. That's how serious it is. But I did my math. I did my Calculate. It all looked good on paper. <laughs> it shit old. Well, it starts winding up out there. And an old man, about this time, uh, on coast to coast, calls in. He's like 76 years old. He was at White Sands that day. He said, I rem he said, and Art says, how do you know it's that day? He goes, because the boy just said, you shut down the base. Nobody was allowed to walk between the buildings or move anywhere. And all the years I've been here, there was only one day that that happened. And never happened again. And that's the day. And that's the date that he says, June 20th, 1971. That's the day. Nobody was allowed to move between the buildings. We thought that was very unusual. So everybody's told to freeze. Well, this thing takes off. It's winding up and winding up. And the flames are roaring out. And they're going from uh, orange to blue to white to clear. That means it's getting so friggin' hot out there. Towers 
Now the shit's falling over. They're melting from the heat. The pan's melting, literally. And then there's a kaboom, like you wouldn't believe. And as a shock wave comes up, so powerful, even over three miles away, it rattles us in the building. And they went, what the hell was that? And then somebody's looking out at the pan and says, well, what's that? And we look out there and there's this white vortex. And we didn't see Pislam. And I already know what happened. Pislam left. You ever try to see a rifle barrel? You ever try to see a bullet leave a rifle barrel? Well, that's what you're trying to do when you're watching. They're thinking rocket, you know, gets faster, faster, faster. No, this thing's boom, boom, two speeds. It's two speeds on this thing, off and wide open. There's no in between. So, so when you literally didn't see it take off. It's just nobody there, saw nothing. And then it's just yeah. Gone. Red phone rings. NORAD it says NORAD on the phone. North American Air Defense Command. You pick it up and you hear the guy on the phone. He's a little bit excited. He's, what the fuck have you people done out there? That White Sands, uh, nothing. We had a civilian missile blow up. Blow up hell. Where you got this thing tracking? Did you look at the speed? You're at Mach 37. There ain't nothing goes Mach 37. He said, it's now 125 miles up. It's now reached apogee the highest point in the curve it's now coming down do you know where it's heading they do and rudolph said yeah we know where it's coming down at and then somebody said what's that and you see that white vortex and i went i said do you know what that is william said what is it i said pistol left so fast she ripped a hole in the atmosphere. You ever heard the phrase, nature abhors a vacuum? That's a vacuum from that pad to space. And sure enough, there goes the Jeep, there goes the utility truck, everything on the pad going up the vortex. Space is sucking it out. Mother Earth is trying to slam the damn vacuum shut. So here it comes back down, hits the ground, kaboom. The people are just getting up off the ground from the last damn concussion wave. And somebody asked, what's that? And I went, that's the atmosphere closing the damn vacuum. It hits the pad the second time. Here comes the second concussion wave. These poor damn people look like flags hanging on a flagpole. And that's why they said nobody moved between the buildings. Because we don't know what's happening. We don't know. Is there going to be more concussions? We don't know. I do. No, this is it. So, um, the old man that called in to Coast to Coast, he said, Thanks for connecting the dots. I've wondered my whole life what the hell that was that day. We saw concussion blasts going all over the place. People flying through the air. We didn't know what the hell was. Explosions on the pad. Something blew up. Something left. We don't know. Thanks for connecting the dots. Now I know what that day was. That's this damn kid and his rocket. And I went, fuck. There we go. Somebody saw it. And he's old. He lives out there in uh, Rachel, Nevada. He don't care. We'll take your pension away. Who cares? He don't give a shit. So, um, it's, going, it's coming down, and it's coming down really fast, and they're not going to pull the parachutes until it's just about where it needs to be, because they don't want people seeing the same track in it. It's going into Groom Lake, just north of S4. So, um, we are told to go get on the DC-9. We're gonna go see it. We're gonna go see your rocket. I went, why the hell are we going so far away? So I get out there. I tell Rudolph about the tires. He just slaps me on the back and pushes me onto the plane. Says, get on the plane. So I get on the plane and um, we go flying out there. And guess what? We fly over this area outside of Nellis. 
and there's this damn big ass airbase. Twin 10,000 foot runways, still under construction. They ain't got the concrete board for it. You can see where the stakes are laid down. And um, John Lear never liked me because I'm five years before him at Area 51. He carries on like he's the only one in Area 51. Bullshit, I was there way before, five years before your ass was. And he never wanted to believe my story. Um, when we landed, we didn't land on the runways. We landed on the taxiways. They're so damn big. The taxiways were finished in front of the three big hangars. So we rolled up to a stop and we passed a big barren patch of desert and there's pistols laying out there with their parachutes. Everything worked just the way I built it. The altimeter snapped off at a certain time and temperature. The uh, sends electrical signals to the solenoids. They open up the side draft chutes Parachutes come out, drug chutes, and the main chutes, and it settled down. Didn't have a scratch on it. Man, I thought, how cool. So that lands in tech, uh, such a successful test. Yeah, it so was. What, a what does Rudolph do? He's all pissed off. I thought he'd be happy about this. And finally, I just turned to him and said, what are you so fucking angry about? Everything worked just perfect. And he just stared out the window and made him even madder. He doesn't like the fact that a 17-year-old American kid is like goddamn light years ahead of everybody. That's what it is. He doesn't want to say it. But I figured out later on, you'll see that's why. He's got a bruised ego the size of the Grand Canyon. Well, I mean, some people say that a lot of the German paperclip scientists, their job was to hold the American space program back. Yeah. R rather than helping it, they were just trying to hold it back and keep the Americans focused on... Yeah, and here I come in the rocket. door and take us a damn quantum leap on the first jump. Right, so, so it's like he's lose, so he's not doing his job that whoever his superiors are, you know, because people believe there's He Germans. is pissed off at me. Right, he's pissed off because he's not, he feels that he's supposed to keep the American rocket and, program back. And for him, it is personal. He's personally zeroed in on me. I am the cause of all this mess. Well, I decided, I guess I am. So, there's more of the story though. We're far from getting to the real meat. And you thought, what the hell else could there be? Well, you'll see. So we get there and I'm listening to all this stuff and I thought, that little son of a bitch is trying to orchestrate for a strike, I guess. He wants to take out the Soviets and Jack and Chinese. I don't know what the fuck he wants. Aryan race, maybe he's trying to take, set the Aryan race in place again. I don't know. But he's definitely got some kind of agenda and he's working it. So, I sat down. <laughs> I remember I just sat down in a damn golf cart looking thing. That was no weird thing. They had these golf carts there. They had no motors. They weren't propane. They weren't internal combustion. But just some kind of big damn crystal light looking thing that would light up, hum like hell, take off, fly like a damn race car, way faster than a damn uh, golf cart should go. You know, I don't know what the hell the thing was. Had a, <laughs> a surrey on top, needed a fringe, didn't even have that. But um, I don't know what those things were. They weren't normal. And then I started noticing all over that base, things aren't normal. I looked at the hangers. The hangers are brand friggin' new, but they're painted with old gray paint with charcoal dust to make it look old. And I thought, I used to put that, do that on models to make them look old. I thought, somebody's trying to make this new hanger look old. And then I looked up the lights on the roof. Guess what the lights had? Louvers. You could, it could project light right in front of the hangar, but out from a distance, you can't see the lights. And I'm going, why they got louvers on lights on the roof out in the middle of here? They don't want this place seen at night. I thought, that's weird. Then we roll up to the center hangar, and then these, Yellow lights start flashing, you know, caution lights. And now the floor comes all these 
poles with chains hooked to them. It's a guardrail all the way around the whole perimeter, the entire hangar. I'm sitting there in that golf cart in the middle of the floor going, what the hell is that all about? Then all of a sudden the, the floor drops. A floor the size of a gymnasium. Made of concrete. Think how much that weighs. Plus whatever you're going to put on top of it. And whatever the hell they put on top of it, it must have been ungodly heavy. Because we went down and I'm looking for cables and chains. There are none. You know what it is? Worm screws in the walls the size of sequoia trees. Eight, twelve of them. And they're lowering the whole thing. I thought, this damn thing could pick up a million damn pounds, I bet. So it lowers down. We go down and down and down and down. And I started counting. And I count 200 feet. I thought, hell, a long ways down. And this is underneath groom, the Groom Lake facility. Yeah. We're going under the facility now. The, the floor is going down. It flushes out. The back wall is solid. Two side walls solid. You look out straight ahead and you go, you're fucking kidding me. There's this canyon, you know, length. It must be 20 damn miles. It's over 20 miles because I know, being a sailor, I know the curvature of horizons. And for that curvature to be that much in there, that means that point we're looking at the top of that curve, that's 20 miles away. 20 miles. And the roof is a canter, like a rainbow, and then when it gets here, it's perpendicular on both sides. And inside are sliding doors, and in those sliding doors are hangar bays, shop bays, all kinds of shit. Over here are some offices. And we take off driving down through there. And I'm looking and it's white. And you can see all the way to the end, 20 miles away, you can see it's lit up. And so I stuck my arm out and I did this and I went, what the hell? And I looked everywhere, no shadows. We're fully illuminated with no shadows. Explain that one to me. No indirect lighting. No lighting of any kind. We're just lit. And so we go down for about a quarter of a mile. And on the left, this door opens. It's 40 feet high. Four stories. It opens up from the center. It's an iris, like a camera iris. It opens up. And when it gets down to the bottom, there's a trench. And then this metal whatever comes across and fills in the trench so now you can drive across it so the big thing opens up it's dark as hell in that room we drive toward it and by the time the end of this golf cart gets to that edge the damn thing lights up and it goes like a rheostat and i'm looking around i'm going still no light fixtures totally illuminated can't see any shadows Explain that to me. You know, nobody's been able to answer me on that question. I asked the audience, anybody out there know? Oh, it's the atmosphere, you're breathing. I went, breathing light, okay. God damn, that makes good sense to anything. But how do you do that? Nobody knows. So, and at the end of this giant room, there's this stage, and it's got... Uh, I beams, whatever it is, it's designed to hold one heavy ass load. And there's something sitting on the stage, but it's got these curtains down around it, and these curtains are like rubber. And I ain't talking about, oh, I'm gonna go peek behind that c curtain. Good luck. You ever pick up a mud flap off of a truck? The rubber mud flap? Mm -hmm. It weighs like 150 pounds. These things are 25 times that size. So they must weigh a half a ton you ain't going to be picking this damn curtain up and look behind it so whatever it is they don't intend for you to be looking and just just to clarify i mean you know you where you, where you descended at uh, groom lake and you go the 20 miles right so you're ending up roughly where people would say is is that the s4 facility no because when we went down 
S4 was behind us. So we're going south of S4. Okay. And uh, that's an area not most people even think about. So I don't know what the hell's out through there. I don't even know where these tunnels go. I only went a quarter of a mile. And the reason I can say a quarter of a mile, I know what a drag strip is. I know exactly how I can tell by right. I've ridden so many of them with petties. I know what a quarter mile feels like, and that's how far we went down. But, but, these hangars that we went by, there were things sitting in them. And they were not fucking jet aircrafts. They were something else. They were live because they had hoses hooked to them. They had drip pans under them. They were working. They weren't models. But they were like giant teardrops with fucking trilateral gears. There were um, spheres just sitting on legs. I don't know what they were. Um, and then there was um, the Mexican hat UFO. One of them was sitting in there. All kinds of things were sitting in these hangars. And people were working on them. And then there was these chambers off to the sides of some of these crafts filled with some kind of gas and people had these real weird looking goggles on would come in and out and the humans would take them off. I don't know if there's non-humans or not, I didn't see any. But as soon as they came out of that gas, they took them off so they could see where they're going. But when they went in that thing, they put them damn goggles on. So I don't know if that was an atmosphere. I don't know what that was, but um, a lot of weird stuff. I don't bother going into detail. When we got to go into this side room, the dude jumped off of the um, golf cart, whatever it was. He, the, dry, the steering wheel was on the right side, not on the left side, on the right side. He jumps off and runs over to this thing. He puts both hands on the counters, looks into this thing as a flash, and then the door opens. So what did I just see? A palm scanner and a retina scanner? In 1971. 1971? There is no such thing. Science fiction movies, maybe. But these people are using it. Hell, we didn't even have a handheld calculator until 10 years later from Texas Instruments. And this guy's got a retina scanner? And I'm going, what is going on with this place? It's fucking weird. And I went, there's nothing normal about anything down here. And, um, just, you know, constant stuff like that was going on. So we get over to this thing on this stage and I ask, finally I just ask, why in the hell am I here? You know, a real effort's been moved my body. You've moved me from Mount Vernon to Wright-Patterson to New Mexico. Now I'm in a God knows cavern of something in a place called Groom Lake. What do you want me to see? And Rudolph just turned to me and said, very perceptive. You're 17? So he's starting to think. Maybe I do know more than I should know. So he hits, he said, do it. That's all he said was do it. Those curtains went up. And I'm sitting there going, God Almighty, look at that. My engine was set on that coffee table. That's all big as it is. It would fit. Might squash it, but it would fit. This thing, the curtain went up. I can look at it at my engine and tell you that's an electromagnetic fusion entertainment engine. You could take two internal combustion engines, a Model A, lay it on the floor, a Lamborghini, put it on the floor, and you could look at both of them and say, well, they're both internal combustion engines. This one's just way more sophisticated and way more power than this one. But they're still working on the same operational procedure. Compression, detonation, expansion, you know, exhaust, and force stroke. So I'm looking at this thing on the stage, the curtain's going up, and this thing is bigger than an 18-wheel semi with the tractor. And I'm going, God almighty damn, it's an electromagnetic fusion containment engine. Figure eight, built like mine. 
but it's got so many fucking different design features on it and it is way more sophisticated than my shit ever was. I've got the Model A. They got the Lamborghini. I'm looking at that thing like, God damn, I thought I was ahead of them. I'm behind something terrible. I've got a clunker. They got a speed demon. But I went, ha! I broke out laughing. Your speed demon's busted. There's a big hole in the side of it. Now, it gets more interesting. The story's just now starting. I'm sitting there and I'm going, You can tell I'm frustrated, depressed. I'm Rudolph's loving this shit. He's finally got something to up my ass, you know. And I, and I looked at him and I said, Boy, you've been busy, little fucker. And he just smiled and then he quit smiling. Because you know why? It's not his. And I said, um, Can I go up on the stage and get a closer look? Air Force people said, no, immediately. Rudolph says, yeah, go ahead. He overrides all, there was full colonels in there. He overrode everybody. It's his project, I guess. When he said, I own it, he ain't kidding. So I walk up the stage, but he's starting to see things. He's starting to see, I may be further ahead than everybody thought, Air Force. He's not a 90, 17 year old. If he is, he's going on 53. He's up there. He's already figured shit out. So I get up there and I'm looking at this thing. And I get about from here to you from it. And I go, hi. Just fucking with it. And then I notice something. My shadow's on it. What the hell I've been telling you through the whole story? There are no shadows. Why is there a shadow on this thing and nowhere else? And I go like this, and the shadow's a half second behind me. I'm like, oh, God. I'm thinking heat recognition alloy. It's picking up on my radiation of my body. Well, who has that shit? Nobody. And I thought, what is this? So I get closer to it. And finally, I just put my hand on it. And that's when it... It's weird because, first of all, I look down the side of it. It's huge. 60 feet is a long. This house is 75 feet long from end to end. We're 64, only 10 feet short of this house. That's long. So I'm looking down the whole length of this thing, and I'm going, what the fuck? Something else. No rivets, no screws, no weld lines, no seams. It's like an eggplant that grew. How the hell did you do that? And I'm going, what the fuck? And also, I had miles of wiring on my thing. Because of all the different detonation points. Do you know, if you had a soccer ball in 1944, your ass would have been arrested for the rest of your life. Because the Manhattan Project was a soccer ball. Exact. Pentagon, 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 Pentagon. Explosive point, 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 point. They all detonated at the same time, causing the atoms to fuse together. Did you know that? Yeah. The original design was a soccer ball. So I'm sitting there going, look at this shit. And then I put my hand on it. And that was something I wasn't expecting. <laughs> My damn thing is made out of God knows what alloy it is. It's so hard. This thing felt like it was alive. It's just like you put your hand on a whale. Or a giant fucking shark. It's like it gives just a little bit and then it stops. And wherever you're touching it, wherever my skin was on its skin, was these radiating blue waves really pretty it's hard to describe they got this thing says to keep executives from going crazy it's a little ocean wave thing that goes back and forth on a desk it looks like that so i take my hand off and went, what the hell is this now so i turned around to rudolph and i said 
can I climb up this thing? Air Force, no. Yeah, go ahead. It's ectoskeleton. Its skeleton is on the outside, just like J.R. Geiger, H.R. Geiger. H.R. Geiger that did uh, Sigoni Weaver's Aliens. He calls it organic technology, ectoskeleton. This thing looked like it was ectoskeleton. And I'm going, but where you put your hand in where it was smooth, that's the organs. And so I climb up what looks to be vertebrates. Giant vertebrates. If you think about a vertebrate with an arm and arm, vertebrate, arm and arm, perfect climbing. Went right up like a ladder. Got to the top of it, and I thought, this looks familiar. It was like a big channel run down the center of this thing's spine and it's translucent it's about that big around and it's got millions of little fiber cables in it and in those fiber cables is something that looks like mercurochrome you ever seen that or methylate more like methylate and i'm going what the fuck be good for a cut you know <laughs> good for methylate and it was flowing all down through this big trunk and thousands and thousands of little fibers running off of it. And I leaned out over to look to the side and I'm like, that looks really familiar. You know what it looks like? A human synaptic firing system. Brains. I thought, good God, is this thing alive? Or is it a machine? Which is it? I can't tell at this point. So it's an organic, inorganic, entity I guess so I'm sitting there going man how sophisticated is this fucking thing and there's all these changes you know I don't know what all that stuff's about I didn't have anything like that I had just wires hmm but it's not true it's got more detail so I walk down the damn vertebrates I get to the middle of it right where Figure eight crosses each other. Eye of the hurricane. And I thought, now there ought to be some shit there because I had to work so hard on mine and I had to use a microscope. Put it over my face and then you're locked to the OR table that you're working on. I mean, it's, it's tedious. And you have to use it all by microscope. This thing's so fucking big you can walk through it. You think I'm going to miss an opportunity like that? Where I've built things under a microscope and now that thing is a size big enough to walk through? I'm not going to miss this opportunity. So I lean over the side where the hole is and it starts getting weirder. The jagged metal that sticks out, I ran my hand across it that fast. Should have cut me all to hell. Not a scratch. And I'm going, you know what it looks like? It looks like a harpoon that detonated in a well and that's like blubber blown out. Once again, organic looking. Not inorganic, organic. And yet it's rigid, I can't move it. Strong. I went, what the fuck caused this damage? And on top of that, I said, this blast came from inside out. But further up on the outside, there's an indication of something coming in. This thing was shot by something. And it came through, I guess, the wall of the ship. Because what I'm standing on is not a ship. It's a power plant. This thing and the ship and the crew, all three merged together in a symbiotic relationship. What a perfect way to fly through friggin' space. You get in trouble, you take a blast, you don't need re damage control, damage parties. You don't need any of that. The janitor mopping the floor down there knows exactly where the ship's hurt and how it's hurt. They're all hooked together. Makes us makes our efficiency on the Navy look pretty damn bad. So this was uh, both a ship and an engine? It's an engine. It's not a ship. Okay. It's just an engine. It's been pulled out of the ship. Oh, I see. So I went, the blast must have came through the ship hull, hit the power plant, 
and I followed the blast. The blast went in. There was a chair there like this, you know, chair, right? Obviously, bipedal anthropoids are around this thing. They wouldn't have a chair like that. But the chair is blown away by the blast coming in. And then when it gets to the wall where the eye of the hurricane is, it stopped. I went, fusion containment stopped it. This thing was shot down by something. So I'm just speculating, figuring out, but the thoughts are coming to me. And it's all making sense. I ain't denying it. I'm saying, damn, baby, it's pretty good. You know, it's, everything's fitting together. And I went, look at that chair. And there's another one on the opposite side. I went, I wonder if they got left and right written on it. You know, maybe it's left and right. So I said, I'll have a seat. So I told Bruce, I'm going to crawl inside, okay? And he said, sure. Air Force said, no, don't. I went ahead. I ain't missing this. So I go in and sit down in a chair. And as soon as I got down like this, I'm not there one second. And then these two domes, this slot slides back and these two domes pop up. And these domes have cutouts. If you take your fingers like that, they fit perfect. I fed them down on it. <laughs> and as soon as I did that, I heard my mother's voice tell me, what I tell you about putting your fingers where you shouldn't? That damn thing, like Batman's Batmobile, you ever seen how it seals itself up? It's got armor playing, chink, 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 mm -hmm. chink, chink. It started doing that up my fingers and got to my knuckles and stopped and then started tightening down. I thought, it's going to cut all 10 of my damn fingers off. So I start to yell for help, right? And then you hear this voice. A female voice sounds like Lauren Bacall. Sultry. He says, David, be quiet. I'm going, okay. <laughs> what are you going to do? And I said, and you are? And she said, and she goes, David, be quiet. I'm trying to think about something. I said, what? She said, my name is Pithlum. Say what? My name is Pithlum. Who the hell do you think sent you your dreams? Knowing that you'd build this thing. Knowing that I'd bring you here. Knowing that you would be up on top of this. Knowing that you'd come in here and sit down. Knowing that I would now be directly connected to you. Oh, oh my God, I've been played. Everybody has. What do you want? Hold still, that's what I want. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And she says, you're going to feel a slight tingle. It's going to go up your arms. And it shouldn't be no more than that. I said, normally when our doctors tell us there's going to be a slight discomfort, it means it's going to hurt like holy hell. And she starts laughing. Nice voice. So it comes up my arms. It gets to right here. It's hot. And then when it hits my, my carotid artery, I get this heads up viewer thing and I'm watching this stuff and it's just thousands of images going by at super speed I went what's going on she goes quiet David I'm downloading into you what downloading what and then she said in a word that you would recognize my Katra and I went search for Mr. Spock God damn, it's a Vulcan's Katra. It's all of her at once. And finally I said, it's hurting. It's burning my brain out. And she says, yeah. All right, we're going to slow down. We, I didn't think you could take it all. You take way more than an average human does. I don't know what it is with you. Maybe it's why I picked you. Why did you pick me? She said, that's another story. <laughs> oh, God, how many more are there? So she said, be still. And then finally, she said, the things let go of my fingers. And she goes, we're done. What are we going to do now? We're going to go. What do you mean we are going? You're a lifeboat. I just bailed out. So just to clarify this, so... Pythium 
was behind you getting dreams when you were 12 years old right. and helped you develop this electromagnetic fusion container right. engine and then setting set in place this chain of events that led you being taken to Area 51 and this underground facility where you found the real... How do you yeah. make a story up like that? I can't. I don't know who the hell can. Do you know anybody who can do that? I mean, that's complicated. Filled with lots of people along the way. Lots of events. She, she had years. That's another thing. How long have you been there? She said, well, when I first landed here, I landed, where'd you come from? I was in a war. What war? War between light and evil is still going on. It's fought between the galaxies. What? There's nothing out there but dark matter. Oh no. She told me in 1970, 1971, she said, there are hundreds of solar systems between the galaxies. We never saw one until they just parked that damn satellite out there, that new one, James Woods. The James Webb Space Telescope? Yes, James Webb Telescope. It turns on and guess what it found? Dozens and dozens of damn solar systems between the galaxies, just like she said. And I said, where are you from? Oh, well, me and my people are born between the galaxies. Like wells and deep oceans. Yeah, it's a good analogy. How old are you? Well, we couldn't date. <laughs> I have a sense of humor. You got humor? Yeah. Well, how old are you? I'm 13 and a half. You're a teenager? Billion years old. Billions of years? Hell, we're lucky to hear people thousands of years old or a million years old. No, nothing that's a big 13. The galaxy is only 14 and a half, 15 billion. Yeah, we were the first things made. So what you what you encountered was this engine that is thirteen and a half billion years old with a consciousness yep. that is integrated into that. Yep. And that was that was crashed or was part of an ancient war and it's been there for They took a blast from something, their enemy, they gave me they even told me the name. I can't remember it. it started with an N. It sounded like Nazi, I swear it did. Uh, anyway, they took a blast in the side. She comes sailing in to the nearest galaxy, the Milky Way. And she said, do you know where you are in the galaxy? Yeah, we're on the very outermost arm on the outside. Which means you're the first class M planet I ran into. The very first one. I was hurt. So I had to find a class M planet quick. You were the first I came up on. When I landed... It was an ocean. Where are they now? They're part of the Great Basin. Nevada. It sits in the Great Basin. It used to be an ocean. I said, well, how old are you? And she said, 30 and a half minutes. Well, how long have you been lying here? Hundreds of millions of years for you. I landed in an ocean. Now I'm in a dry lake bed. I'm like, God almighty. Well, what's with this damn Air Force with Chico? Is that what you call them? Yeah, we got, they're Air Force personnel. She says, we got another name for them. What? Blackhearts. We will not work with Blackhearts anymore. We've been here long enough. So what happened to the crew of the... I asked her, I said, okay, so there's you and the ship and the crew. What happened? I was jettisoned at the first... When Beirut was tore all to hell, the USS Enterprise pulled up. And you know what it did? It ran power cables into the city and they ran off the nuclear reactors of the carrier for years. So, that makes total sense. Standard procedure, they're going down. They jettisoned their primate, excuse me, their, their power plant. She drops out, skids into a stop. Ship goes on, crew's gone. Where'd they go? She don't know. I wonder who got hold of them. She said, never heard from them again. I said, well, that's not a 
a good story. I said, are you okay? She goes, yeah, I'm fine. I'm a lot better now with you. Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. You're telling me I'm a lifeboat? What, I'm going to have to carry your ass around with me for the rest of my life? Uh, yeah. I ain't go she goes, what are you going to do? I ain't going to tell nobody this story. Not until I'm about dead. Because I don't want to hear the shit that I'm going to have to pick up on it. But that explains a lot of things. She says, like what? How, when they did a scan on me, there were two brain scans. And that's documented. Call Emery. Ask him what did he find. So Emery Smith did a yeah. brain scan? Or yeah. that your brain scan? No, he did a whole body scan. He said, there's another person in you. What? It's a female. What? How do you know? He said, look at it. He said, look at the schematics. There's two separate pat. There are two of you. He said, no wonder we couldn't figure out what was going on with you. And that's just the start of things. Uh, all through my life. So you're, you're carrying the consciousness of this ancient being, Pythium, that is... Pythium. Pythium. That is 14 billion years old. Yeah. And, and has... 13, 14 billion, yeah. That has all of this knowledge, yeah. this knowledge over... And this... <laughs> Now, you want to be put in your place? Yeah, please. Okay. <laughs> Not everybody runs on a Julius Caesar calendar, Michael. Because I asked her, I said, where the hell's your people? We down, a pilot goes down, we go after him, buddy. I mean, we just, I mean, we pack up and take off. And she says, yeah, that's on your chronological timeline. And not everybody runs on a Julius Caesar calendar. And I went, well... Where does that leave you? She goes, my family's coming. Your family? Part of the battle fleet. I went, you got an armada coming this way? God almighty damn, where you going? And she says, relax, we're not, we don't conquer worlds. But if, if we did, we would put yours out of its misery. I went, that's a sense of humor again. Okay, I agree with that. But she said, but then there's yous. Or oh, she said, in your vernacular, use them. There's use them. You know, we'll ask people in the South, what use them doing over there? <laughs> she said, when this fleet is arriving? No, but she said, they've been en route for a while, which means they could be here any time. So this was in 1971, so they, they could have arrived a couple of years ago. Absolutely, we don't know. Well, people are saying. Well, like I said, people are saying a fleet, a big fleet, yeah. arrived in the in the vicinity of Jupiter, and that space command sent an armada to greet them. It gets better. I went, where are you in this family thing? Are you the first daughter, second daughter? She goes. She goes. Well, we have a uh, a hierarchy. Really, like patriarch, matriarch. Yeah, it's uh, mostly uh, matriarch. Female driven, and you're a female. Where are you in this? Well, let's just say my mother's the queen. You're a princess? Are you serious? I said, I can't get just an ordinary alien. I got to get a princess. She said, now your humor is good. I said, lady, I'm so far from humor, it's not funny. I'm just short of freaking out here. Can you just explain, I mean, Pithalum, the, the consciousness, do you have the consciousness of the ship, of the engine, and of the crew? I mean, how, how, can, a, how can an engine be a princess? Because they're inorganic and organic technology. They're not like us. They're machine-driven. So who, whatever top machine was, her mother, is a ruling body of that entire organization or entity or whatever i don't know i'm not one of them okay well you know i mean i think of the series transformers but she's not see you're thinking human now transformers is machines. right this machines. is something else so i'm sitting there going and i have been so many times i've been corrected and i thought 
damn, I don't understand any of this shit. She said, that's okay. You really not expected to. I said, I always tell my friends, I'm crazy, so they don't expect anything out of me. They go, he's crazy. Oh, okay. It's like, he's from Canada. Oh, okay. And she goes, good humor. She goes, my family's going to love you. I went, oh, God, I I'm having a hard enough time with just one of you. And uh, I said, well, what now? I said, I had five heart attacks in four days. I should be dead. I died twice on the table. You can talk to my doctor, Dr. McDonald. He'll tell you, yeah, he's dead. Brain activity gone, no heart activity for a minute. Hit him with the paddles one more time before I call him. Boom, blows him off the table, comes back down. As soon as he hits the table, bang, he's back. And not only is he back, his heart has zero injury. I have no, just had an EKG put on me last Friday. I have zero injuries, none. He, he put six stents in me. He said, it should show the stents. It, the EKG acts like he's never been touched. He said, I don't know how to explain this. He's dead three weeks ago. He comes into the office, his oxygen is 99. His blood pressure is 120 over 70. His pulse is 72. It's like he's an 18 year old that's never been hurt. He should be a wreck. He's got diabetes on top of it. His A and C has dropped three points. Went from 12 to nine. He said, if anything, he's healing up. Beyond, the, you saw the nurse here with me and I just passed everything. She said, I ain't never seen anything like it. And uh, they gave me this thing to exercise with. Like I some problem. Right. And I can jump rope with the damn thing. And they're going, you know, how are you doing that? <laughs> well, I've got this alien into me, inside me. She's using me for a lifeboat. She don't want to lose her lifeboat, so she's probably causing all kinds of shit to occur in there. I don't know. So Pipalum is maybe helping you heal from this. I was cold stone dead three weeks ago. Do I look like I've been dead? No. I looked in the mirror when they took me away in the ambulance. I was whiter than this paper. My eyes were black, sunk back so far in I couldn't even see the retinas. And I looked in the mirror in the bathroom in there and I went, I'm dying. Blood pressure, 60 over 40. I'm dying. I get three words out. It's the last three words I could say. Get an ambulance. So they come in here and they pick me up and they wheel me out. And they tell me, you are in such bad shape. So as soon as the ambulance wheels stop turning in Fry's emergency entrance, the guy working on me is just saying, I got 22 seconds and you're going to be dead on the 23rd. I have got to do something. I've been holding off doing this. It's the last ditch effort. I tried getting blood in both your legs and both your arms and you have total blockage. There's no way I can get blood into your cavity and you're going to be dead in 18 seconds. So I got to do something called a ball and pin. You ever heard of that? I haven't. You ever see the top of this shoulder? He pulls up this drill. Big ass woodworking drill. And he's got a gold cone on top of it. And he said, I'm going to drill down the top of your shoulder, through your bone, into your bone marrow. Then I'm going to flood the cavity where the heart is with a flood, a tsunami of blood. Otherwise, you're going to be dead in the next few seconds. He's got 18 seconds. He stands up like this. He didn't say another word. Puts the drill on me. Bang. I was a 12-year-old girl. I was screaming and hollering, God almighty, damn. Can you imagine what that feels like? A drill bit going into the bone marrow? And there's a flood through, and he's watching monitors, and he goes, I have eight seconds left. You're going to make it. And I make it. Um, so, that's... um. Crazy stories it is. <laughs> yeah.
And it reminds me of this story. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> right, and that, that, that happened to Pippalum into Jew in 1971. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, what, you know, what, what happens next? I mean, you're on the craft, you're in, in the craft, you're on the I seat. don't know what, you know, I told her, I said, I had heart attacks, I'm dying. I'm laying on the bed, they're le reading last rites over me, and I am talking to Pithlum. I said, I'm sorry, but I'm my lifeboat, I'm, I've kind of sunk out from under you. I don't know what you're going to do. Where's your family? She said, don't worry, we're going to take care of all this. You'll be all right. I come out of this thing defying every explanation there is. I should be just damn dead. I shouldn't even be able to sit up and talk like this. She saw me stand up and I'm walking back and forth, walking back and forth. I shouldn't be able to do that. Somebody who was dead three weeks ago can't do that. The atrophy of the muscles can't support it. I've had bruises. This bruise was the entire of this arm. And I have a bruise this big, black. And I shouldn't even be able to move this leg. Six stents went up through this fold right here, up into my calf, chest cavity. That's enough to kill somebody. You know, you can't hardly move. I hemorrhaged at 3.38 that morning. Spewed blood onto the ceiling across the wall. And they had to put two gallons of blood in me. And eight, they, eight pints. All my blood was gone. It was on the walls and ceiling. And they put it back in and it barely moves the damn hemoglobin 0 0.01. So they said, give him another bag. He's not dead. Give me another bag. Come right back. Felt great. And even Dr. Uh, McDonald and Dr. Graham, they're sitting there. They said to me, they were sitting in their chairs looking at me when I woke up. And they said, we normally don't talk like this, but we're going to have to. What the hell are you still doing here? You should be dead. Nobody does this. I ain't never seen anything like it. Dr. Graham, I ain't never seen nothing like this. So they both concluded they know why I'm here. And I go, why am I here? You're after the hospital food. <laughs> so I thought, okay, humor, they're using humor. They must feel better about me. Mm -hmm. And they said, you're going to make it. They said, you're going to be out walking normal, no crutch, nothing. You'll be driving a car. Done did that today. I drove the car just fine. So, and I thought, not bad for a dead guy. And um, Amazing recovery from three weeks. Yeah, they ago. said you should have at least brain damage. None. Arterial damage should be everywhere. None. EKG goes perfect. Crosses the entire page. I have one of the strangest heartbeats I ever heard. I said, what's it sound like? They said, it's hard to describe. Like an echo? Yeah. Two heartbeats. I'm not alone. And uh, I didn't want to tell them that. I said, I've got two hearts in there. Hard to kill somebody that's got two hearts. Mm -hmm. And um, so, well, the people I'm I don't know what's next. I do know this. This was told to me by J.C. himself in person. Ask Daniel Brinkley about this. He does show up in person at times. He showed up not once, but twice. He made a comment about it. He said, this is the second time today, he goes, or no, second time in four days. He goes, you're making a habit of this. We've got to stop that. I said, sense of humor again. So you're talking about near-death experience? Yeah. And when, he's telling me, he said, attack, you, right. you can't come home. Dad says, Dad says, you got a lot to do, and he's not through with you, and there are others not through with you. And I went, I thought your dad was mad at me. <laughs> I mean, I've had a really rough life. To, you know, it's, it's been a fabulous life, but it's been rough. I have no relatives. Everybody's dead. I'm alone. I don't have any living relatives. I'm alone on this planet. And uh, I'm sitting there going, he said, nah, 
Dad, you're one of his favorites. He likes watching you. He said, you're so fun to watch. I went, oh, I sure could use a break, you know, I'm tired. And he said, oh, you're going to get some help. So, I don't know what's going on, but I do know this. I never cared about recognition. Don't care. Don't care if you remember my name. Don't care if you remember anything about me. I'll just come and I'm gone. That's all it was. Smoke. But I do wish y'all would know what I went through because there's a story there. I mean, it's, it's packed with everything. And um, are we alone? Hell no. We're not only not alone. We've got people, not just spiritual side, we got entities all over this planet. Uh, we're in trouble as a species. We're in so much trouble. We have become a galactic pastime to watch. You know, what's going to happen with them earthlings next? Let's tune them in and see. Mm -hmm. They're about to kill themselves. You know, do we come in and save them like we did in 2012? When we bumped them three MEs out of the way, mm -hmm. CMEs? And, um... So, so this, this, uh, the incident in 1971 and, and this fleet that's arriving now, is, I mean, is somehow... I think it's, connected to... I think it's her fleet. Because mm -hmm. I asked her, I said, well, what now? I haven't got a whole lot of time. She said, well, that's true, you don't. I went, oh, God. She said, no, nah, don't worry, it's not like that. She said, um, it's going to, you got some changes coming. And I'm going, oh, shit, I don't like these words from her. You know, I said, you like that doctor? It's going to be a little uncomfortable. Changes, what, I'm going to end up on another planet? I mean, I end up with your race? What, you know? Maybe. <laughs> she goes, you have proven yourself to be way more resilient than we ever thought. We're not exactly sure who or what you are. I said, well, hell, all my friends tell me that. George lives up here, Hancock, he's a Navy guy. He swears to God he, I'll never die. He's a real born-again Christian. And he says, why did you gravel your whole yard, all of it? It's gravel all the way around, two acres of it. I said, I don't know, I just don't like mowing grass. He said, no. You did that because that's so the damn ships can land here and take your ass away. Because you're never going to die here. You're going to go off somewhere. And I'm going, that's a Judeo-Christian tell me that? Well, is there another possibility that when this fleet arrives, or if it's here, that you might be a spokesperson for them? <laughs> you know, <laughs> at one time, for just a few seconds, I entertained that thought. I thought, God, what a sense of humor they must have. To pick my ass, you know, Mr. Cyclone, like, I'm going to bring calm and peace. I'll do anything but that. It seems like there's mayhem occurs everywhere I go. No matter what I do, I'll be sitting still, minding my own business, and it hunts me down. Um, white rhinoceros. I'm walking down the street. Next thing I know, I'm being mopped. <laughs> right, but, but you have your... You're a truth seeker, you express the truth, and people want that. People yeah. are looking for leaders. leaders and, and, and people don't believe in the establishment. People don't believe in Washington, D.C. I don't know. Like no credibility, but you do because of your history and what you've experienced. Somebody asked me if I would go through all this again, knowing I'd get all this. I said, for the people, yeah, I would. For the government, fuck no. But for people, yeah. I take I face the fires again. Yeah, I'll go through it. I'll fight for you. But for the government, I ain't gonna do it. Um, just not gonna do it. For people, I will. Nobody seems. Don't seem like anybody stands up for the average person anymore. Nobody wants to risk it. <sighs> um, you know, the second time I was shot down. I flew over this village, I napalmed it. I burned all these women and children into ash. I saw them out the damn jet, close enough to see their eyes. And I flew over this one hut. That damn thing detonated so bad it blew my jet out of the sky. 
I ended up in a, a bellied into a uh, rice paddy. But for that hut to blow up as bad as it did, it was a ammunition pile. It was a target. But they put all these innocent people around it. So I'm sitting in the prison camp. I'm talking to the base commander. He had excellent English. And I asked him, could you please take me to that village uh, in Napalm? Why do you want to go over there? I want to apologize to the people. I just feel so bad about it. I didn't want to do it. He said, let me get this straight. You're voluntarily asking me to take you to see the village. Yeah. Do you know we beat pilots to a pulp to get them to go do that and they won't? And you're saying, you, why? It was wrong. It obviously was a target because the way it blew up and blew me out of the sky. But those people weren't targets. They were just trying to live their lives and I incinerated them. I feel so bad about that. He sat there and he goes, can you sign any papers of that? No, it's an honor thing. Can't do that. I'm not a, can't do a Hanoi Jane here. And he said, okay. He said, you know, the other night I saw you with my guards. They gave their flashlights to you so you could point the stars out to them. I said, yeah. And he said, well, first I was a horde to think you're giving a POW a flashlight. <laughs> God, am I, I should have went out there and shot everybody, all of you. And then I thought about it, I thought, why would my guards do that? They've been excellent guards. Now I ask the guards to beat you and they won't. And what was your suggestion? I went, I can get you off the hook. He goes, how? Call the guards from another base. Let them come over here and beat the shit out of me. And then you'll be satisfied. Your bosses will be satisfied. And your guards won't be mad at you. So, so this is an incident where you were a, a prisoner, prisoner, POW. A prisoner of war. Yeah, yeah. so I Vietnam said, war. he said, you shouldn't be here. That's what he said to me. He said, you, you're not a problem. You shouldn't be here. I said, I've been telling that to everybody. I said, we're in a 2,000 year old civil war over here. We're interfering in something we got no business in. We shouldn't be doing this. But I can't sign papers because it's an honor thing. But if you want to beat me to a pulp, I'd actually appreciate it because if not, I'm going to get labeled as a traitor. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I understand that. He goes, God, I see my, now I see why my men don't want to beat you. I want to let you go. If I had my choice, I'd just drop the gate and just say, call for a rescue and send you off. He said, damn. I've never met anybody like mm. you. But well, this happened a few years after all of this stuff with... Uh, yeah, Pithlum was in me at that time. Pithlum and, 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 and... Let me tell you about another. And now this story will make sense to you. On my first capture, I escaped. And they pulled all ten of my toenails off with water pump pliers. That hurt. And then they put me down a pig shit pit hoping my feet would get infected. They never did. I was 170 pounds and I ran the 100 yards in 10.0. That's 30 feet per second. That's a little width different. I mean, I could smoke your ass. I was bolt. I was gone. And, um, so, they pulled my toenails off. Still could run fast. Outran them. I outran them. I was running through the jungle. Two guys are after me. They K-47s. And I run so fast. I was going through the elephant grass. Can't see. Ran out. Just like Bud's Bunny, I'm in midair. You know how they stop and go, I never studied laws of gravity, you know. But I'm standing there going, God Almighty. And then I fall. I fall about 30 feet. I hit the soft grass about that thick. Didn't hurt. And I'm rolling over, go, ah. And I raise that, and from here to you is a Belgian tiger the size of that damn couch. And it's looking right at me like it's in his ears are going down. And I'm going, oh God. And I went, wait, wait. There are two men coming. I'm going like that. They're going to kill me and you. 
So that thing looks up, it looks back down, and when it looked back up, it's where your ears went down. When it looked back at me, the ears came up. And I went, that's time to go. So I said, I'm going. I take off running. I hear those two guys run out and drop down in front of that tiger. All I hear is bones crunching. That thing ate them, both of them. And I didn't have to run anymore. I walked out. And I often wondered when I was looking at that tiger right in its eyes, I don't think I was by myself. Somebody else was talking. You think that was Pitham, talking? She was talking straight to that cat. And that cat got it all. And its ears were telling me what to do. First it put its ears down when it looked at me. Then it looked up and its ears were up. And then the ears went down while I was looking up. Then it looked back down at me and its ears came back up. And all I felt inside was time to go. You have been listening to ExoPolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.